as a picture. Okay, there we go. There we go. Praise God, everybody. Elder Cedric Rice. And I haven't talked to you for a long time. I guess you can tell the way you see me staring at the camera trying to get everything set up. Um, I haven't done a video in quite a while. And, and I know there were some of you who really listened to my videos. I thank God for that. And um, I will be starting back now. And I will be doing them again on a regular basis. Um, what has happened... And the reason I hadn't done a video in a while is that I had been working on a major project. Um, I had written a series of electronic books, which are on Amazon. And, um, you know, electronic books, just, just short uh, books on different Bible subjects. And I have written a total of 50 electronic books, uh, teardrop on various Bible subjects and they are listed on Amazon and they can be downloaded and what will happen in the future is that you will see me I'll begin downloading the links and sending out the links uh, to different uh, messages and different books on Amazon and you will be able to purchase them there and the reason that I'm doing so is for the support of missions, uh, 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 trips across the world, uh, starting in Africa and across the world. We have established a, uh, an, an organization uh, um, in, in Africa and um, we have some adherents also in other countries. And my goal, uh, what we're doing is promoting ministries um, that go out and preach the gospel and helping to facilitate ministers, preachers of the gospel, uh, who preach the gospel. Amen. And, and I check them out first. Amen. We check them out first. And the purpose is to help facilitate the preaching of the gospel around the world. And we have members. Uh, we have, a, 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 as a matter of fact, we have a goodly amount of members. And this is the first project that I am personally doing. And the whole purpose of this project is to raise funds uh, to support uh, this ministry and to support uh, missions and in, in the spreading of the gospel around the world. Now, when I say missions, I'm not oriented to a lot of the other mission uh, work that is necessary. And, but I mean, if anybody wants to do a lot of the other things, that's fine, but my calling is to be a teacher of the gospel. And so I'm remaining uh, uh, um, true to my calling, which is to teach the gospel. Amen. And so this is what my focus is. But I mean, if you have a calling to do something else, you know, um, well, that's certainly that's well and that's fine. Amen. And, and we encourage you to do so. And uh, maybe we can work together if you want. Uh, we can see what we can do. Amen. And But like I say, the thing is for the veterans of the saints around the world. We're doing this for the saints around the world. What I have found out in my travels is that many different religious organizations have gone into different countries and they have uh, called themselves um, evangelized in those countries. Well, the problem is, is, you know, a lot of these organizations which have done so uh, are based on false doctrine and false religion. And I have found that uh, people need to be taught the word of God. Amen. You know, we need preaching and we need crusades, but we need teaching. We need sound, fundamental teaching of the word of God for the saints of God. And I have found that people appreciate it. Um, they appreciate uh, teaching, especially in places where they haven't really received it in the way that we're doing it now. Uh, you know, people have been preached to, people have been lied to, you know, not, I mean, preach to, you know, preach, not saying preaching is lying. People have been preached to, but people have also been lied to a lot. 
And so they appreciate it uh, when we can take them into the depths of the Word of God and actually show them the mind and the heart of God. Amen. And feed them with nothing but the truth. I will be starting this session. And also, um, my sessions used to be timed. And the reason uh, that they were timed is because I was also, I had a 30-minute radio broadcast. And I was doing sessions. I had to keep them inside of that 30 minutes so that they would fit into the radio broadcast. Well, the radio broadcast has gone in a different direction now. And so I'm, my broadcast, I, I, I'm doing more longer broadcast, but I'm also doing them live and in person. And they're not really recorded anymore. So therefore, I don't have to cater my Facebook post to the same people who I, I broadcast to on the radio. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to go willy-nilly crazy and make these broadcasts super long because um, I know that I give out a lot of information uh, when I teach. I, I know I give a lot of information. And I know that it's best if you're doing it on this type broadcast. And, and, and the thing that I like about video is that you can look at it and you can rewind it and you can get your pencil and paper and if you get to a point where you hear something you can stop and write that scripture down for future reference but I, I won't be doing long broadcasts because you know people's attention span especially in these days and this time uh, people's attention span is not long uh, because that's because in the, the days that we live in there are so many uh, things out there that get our attention and I have found, you know, that it's affected me because I will sit and I'll do two and three things at one time now. You know, whereas in the past, I didn't do that. Amen. I just did one thing at a time. But, you know, I catch myself doing two or three things at the same time, all of the time, constantly. And so that's the information age we live in. And then I know personally, if I listen to a broadcast... And if that broadcaster doesn't say anything in the, in the first few minutes of that broadcast um, that's going to grab my attention or that's significant, I'm not going to waste any more time listening to it. And so I'm not going to uh, uh, come on here with long broadcast, long broadcast because we live in the information age. Amen. And people process information quickly. And if you're like me, and, and most people, we've got a lot of different things going on. And so we won't dwell on something uh, for a very long time. But that's fine. Hey, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bend and we'll, you know, we'll be flexible and we'll move. You know, if, if, if things go left, we'll roll left. If things roll to the right, then we roll to the right. And that's survival. I want to start back. Now, I'm getting to my message now. I want to start back in the book of Revelation. Um... I ended it up, that's, I was doing a series, and when I stopped doing that series, I had a lot of people asking me, was I going to uh, continue? And I was just working on my project then, and so uh, the project was very time-consuming. So we completed 50, 50, five zero electronic books on different uh, uh, topics of Scripture, and a lot of those topics are controversial topics. And uh, we, just like this, this uh, teaching here, the broadcast that I do here, we use scripture. Uh, I stick with the scriptures on everything. Amen. Because, you know, that's the only way to be true. Um, so we stick with the word of God and, and a lot of things, a lot of myths, a lot of things that people believe that's just not true. Well, we go back and we show you, we debunk uh, those things and in the um, uh, e-books. And it's not that we're trying to make anybody look bad. We're not confrontational, but we want to make sure uh, that people hear the truth. Amen. You know, uh, we need to hear the truth and we need to know the truth. Okay, let me start with Revelation chapter 18. Before I begin, let me give you a context, kind of get you in the right time frame of where we are in the book of Revelation. In chapter 18, uh, what has happened is that... Uh, Jesus has opened those seals. We talked about that in the previous chapters. Um, God has uh, allowed judgments to happen on the earth. He's allowed judgments to happen on men. And we know that God's judgments are progressive. Um, in, in other words, they go from least difficult 
or least uh, 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 uncomfortable to more difficult and more uncomfortable because what he's doing, he's trying to get men to see the errors of their ways and repent. So uh, his judgments, they start out easy. And when he talks about Pharaoh hardening his heart in the book of Exodus, what happens is that every time God judges, Pharaoh has to make a, con a, 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 a conscious decision to disobey. And that's what's called the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And a lot of people, I've heard people teach that, well, see, God hardened his heart so that he can show his glory. Okay, that's true. But now, God didn't make Pharaoh be something that he wasn't already. See, God didn't say, hmm, let me pick Pharaoh and I'm going to make him my subject and I'm going to harden him and so I can mess with him. No. When he hardened Pharaoh's heart, what he meant is that every time uh, that a judgment fell, Pharaoh had to make a conscious decision to disobey because he knew it was God. Amen. There was no doubt in his mind it was God. But every time a judgment happened, Pharaoh had to make a decision, a conscious decision, uh, that he was going to disobey God. And that was the hardening of his heart. And it started with something easy, and it was easy for Pharaoh to say no, and then the next judgment will be a little bit harder. Amen. And then he would say no again, and then the next judgment will be more difficult, but Pharaoh would still say no. And it was a process, really, of bringing out of Pharaoh what was already in him. Amen. And so that's what God meant when he said he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He wasn't going to make it. He didn't make it anything other than what it already was. What he did is he brought out what was already there. Okay. Now, in chapter 18 of Revelation, it's talking about God's judgment on the one world religious and political system that Satan is using to control the world. Uh, Satan wants to control and dominate the world. And he does it through a small group of people. You know, in any organization, you got a hierarchy of leadership. Uh, in this hierarchy, Satan is the top dog. And his um, main two underlings are the false prophet and the Antichrist. And the Antichrist used the kings and the merchants on the earth uh, to rule the earth because it's a political and a religious system. The religious system is ruled by the false prophet. And what the false prophet does is he turns people's worship to, to worship Satan rather than to worship God, uh, whether they know it or not. Amen. Now, one difference, the major difference in worshiping God and serving Satan is that uh, when you serve God, you know it and you do it consciously. But Satan don't care if you know you're serving him or not. He just wants your worship. Amen. And if he doesn't, if you don't give it to him, he will deceive you and steal it from you. And so this is the system that we have. And it's called uh, Mystery Babylon. Uh, it's a mystery because it's a mystery to men. Because it's a system that's been put in place. And men who are under this system and actually serving in it don't actually realize what's happening to them. And it's a system of control. It's a system of domination. Uh, it's a system that the enemy uses just to have control over the world. And men and women of the world are unwitting and, and they're being led down this trail, amen, without knowing uh, uh, what's happening. And so that's why it's a mystery. Okay, Revelation 18 and 1 out of the King James Bible. And after these things, now when John says after these things, he's talking about after all of the plagues, all of the events that God has done in the previous chapters. Because see, in the previous chapters, God used angels uh, to, to pour out his plagues. Amen. He used his preachers to speak his word on the earth. So now after all of these things have happened, after all of these judgments have gone forth, this is what John's talking about. He says, I saw another angel. Now, when he speaks of another angel, he's actually speaking of another type of angel. He says another angel. But what he's saying here is this angel is different from all of the other angels that I've seen uh, uh, so far, you know, in this thing that's going on. 
And this is another type of angel. And then he gives a description of this angel. And it lets us know that this angel is none other than God himself. Amen. Okay. And it says he came down from heaven having great power. And the key here, one key here, three keys, another angel, another type of angel. Okay. Uh, having great power power. All of the angels had great power. But what John means is this angel had greater power than all of the other angels so far. Amen. Having great power. He means greater power. He's seen great power, but he's talking greater power. This angel has greater power than every other angel he's seen before. And then he says, and the earth was lightened with his glory. This angel was so bright that his glory uh, 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 made the old, whole earth light. Amen. It brightened the whole earth. And so the glory of this angel was equal, I can say, to the glory or the light of the sun. Amen. Which shines on the earth. Uh, uh, the sun is the only thing I know that can brighten the whole earth. And John is saying it's brightening. It may be brighter, amen, than the sun uh, because the sun brightens the earth. But obviously the glory that this angel possesses or that the glory that John witnesses is more than what he normally witnesses just by seeing the sun. Okay. Because why? Because he makes a point to describe it. So if he makes a point to describe that the whole earth was lightened, the earth is lightened every day. But if John made a point to describe uh, uh, that the whole earth is lightened, then he's talking about a light that's superior. Okay. Now this angel is going to announce the fall of Babylon the Great. Amen. And so that's why it was such a powerful angel, um, because it, it was powerful enough to bring down uh, the mystery Babylon, which has up until this time had power over the people on the earth. Um, I do believe that this is the beginning of the seven thunders. When we uh, study the book of Revelation, um, in the previous chapter, God had um, the seven thunders uttered, you know, and began to sound. And John wrote, he, at, at some point, he said that the seven thunders began to sound. But then he told, he also wrote that God told him, do not write uh, what the seven thunders utter. And we went back to the book of Deuteronomy. I believe it's Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. And it, it, it talks about the things that God keeps secret belong to him. So from that, we can conclude that those seven thunders are judgments that come from God, amen, on the earth, and they are personal. The judgments, uh, uh, see, notice now, Jesus brought mercy, but God will bring judgment. Amen. Uh, we talk about the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, it cleanses. But the blood of Jesus also brings judgment. See, you know, as for us, those who are in Christ, we are fortunate in that we are on the right side of his blood. Uh, just like the blood that flows through the body. Amen. You have blood is cleansed in the heart. If you, you look at Jesus, uh, uh, he's the heart. Um, blood is mixed with oxygen. Amen. In the lungs, the life is circulated through the body. It removes all of the, 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 the toxins. Uh, it removes uh, uh, the waste from the cells. And it takes those where they're disposed of. Well, the blood of Jesus. And the clean blood circulates. And then the dirty blood has to come around. And the dirty blood is cleansed. Amen. And those things that are taken from the body are removed from the body. And I'm saying this. If we can think of sin in the, in the exact way. Um, the effects of sin are taken away from us. We are washed in his blood. And when you wash, your bath water becomes contaminated. When this contamination is removed, it is, it's not destroyed because it's happened. So you can't say it never happened. It's not destroyed. It's removed. And when this contamination is removed, it's placed somewhere. When we do it, uh, uh, say our garbage, the contamination that we don't use, is put, is put in the dump. 
Well, guess what? Hell is God's dump. It's his garbage dump. That's where he dumps the sin. Amen. And those who go into hell, um, they go into the dump because they're really dumped also. And they live in this rancid, stank dump forever and ever and ever because the sin doesn't go away. It just it, it, it remains in hell. It's removed. The darkness is separated from the light, but the darkness does not go away and the light doesn't go away. Amen. They are put in different worlds. And so uh, um, in the Old Testament, there was a uh, ritual where they had an animal called a scapegoat. Uh, an escape goat was used uh, sometimes as a animal of sacrifice. And the person uh, whose sin was to be forgiven would place his hands on the head of that scapegoat. And that scapegoat, uh, once those sins were transferred to the scapegoat, the scapegoat would be released and he'd go out into the wilderness and he would roam and live in the wilderness forever. He would never come out of the wilderness. Well, that scapegoat represents those who are finally cast into the lake of fire. Amen. The wilderness represents, it's, it's the lake of fire. It's a barren place, a place where there is no life. And that scapegoat is cast into the lake, lake of fire. And, and uh, those who remain in sin, they remain in the lake of fire forever and ever. And there is no forgiveness for them. Amen. Um, there is no forgiveness. Once judgment falls, once the judgment of God falls, then um, that's it. You know, once we enter into eternity, um, there, there is no forgiveness in eternity. Um, it, what happens in eternity remains there. So when there is no more time, uh, uh, we live in eternity and eternity is always presently now. So there is no past and no future. There's only the now. And what's in the now will always be there. So God created time for the purpose of salvation. He created time uh, when he, he separated the, the day and the night. And then he gave us the, the weeks, you know, the days and the nights. When he created days, he created time. Well, in eternity, there will be no more time. Amen. Nevertheless, okay, let me, let me continue. Okay, verse 2 says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice. This is that angel saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And I really believe this is the judgment of the first thunder. Amen. Which uh, John was told not to write. Now, there may be something more significant uh, that was said. I don't know. But I do believe these are the thunders, the seven thunders uh, being uttered. Because in chapter 17, Right near the end of the chapter, it tells you, and the seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay. And it's become the habitation of devils and the hole of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So in other words, every foul and evil spirit is locked in a cage. Amen. And this system was brought down. It's brought down where? To hell because it's purged from this earth. And this system becomes a cage of every foul bird, foul birds, foul, hateful, evil, demonic spirits. Okay. Then in verse 3 says, for all nations, all nations, A-L-L, -L, all, every single one, every nation on this earth have done what? Have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this is a system which affects the entire world. Amen. The entire world has been affected uh, by this system. When he says have drunk of the wine, that means that the wine of the wrath of her fornication is those evil deeds um, that, that she has committed. Those evil deeds have affected the entire world and they have caused uh, things to happen in this world. Amen. Uh, they've caused calamities to happen. They've caused catastrophes to happen. Why? Uh, because the people who run this system, uh, uh, their main weapon is to create calamities, create catastrophes. Amen. So that they can get the compliance of the people who live on this earth. Uh, um, the model order, order, O-R-D-O, a-B-C-H-A-O is the motto of this cabal of evil people who rule the world. Uh, uh, order out of chaos. Amen. They create a system of chaos. 
And out of that system of chaos, they, they begin to manipulate the people of the world to be puppets, amen, to do exactly what they want them to do. So they create the chaos. And then people feel like, okay, we need help. Y'all help us. And then they give you a situation to help you in that chaos. And what that situation does is it forces you to lose some of your freedoms. It forces you to give up your individuality. Amen. And so this is the, the tactic that has been used over and over and over throughout history. And then it says, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Now, if these kings committed fornication, then they knowingly knew what they were doing. Who are the kings of the earth? Presidents, the rulers of countries, prime ministers. Amen. A uh, 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 high level government officials. Amen. The kings of the earth. So obviously the kings of the earth knew what they were doing. Now, I'm not telling you a conspiracy theory that popped up in my mind. I'm reading this out of the book of Revelation chapter 18 out of the King James, the King James Bible, amen, which was written by men who were led and inspired by the Holy Ghost. And if you think I'm lying, get you a King James Bible, open it up to chapter 18 and read what was written so many thousands of years ago. Okay, it says, um, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax, are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The merchants of the earth, um, the people who make money out of, out of crisis. Uh, let's look at wars. You know, there's always uh, so many wars going on in the earth. And I'm here to tell you that most of those wars are instigated. Instigated by who? Instigated by people that have something to gain from the war being fought. Well, who has something to be gained from a war being fought? The people who make bombs, the people who make bullets, the people who, who manufacture uh, uh, tanks, aircraft. Amen. And so if they didn't have wars, they wouldn't make money. And so I'm here to tell you that most wars that you see uh, uh, somewhere, they're instigated, they're thought about, they're, they're, somebody talks about it in a boardroom, uh, somebody finds the places where they can be instigated, somebody finds a way where people can be stirred up, amen, and Satan is behind it, God is not behind it, God is not the author of confusion, amen, and they instigate these things and then they cause wars to happen, okay, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Okay, come out of her, my people. Um, unfortunately, Sometimes we as saints get caught up in the things of the world. What happens is that in order to survive in the world, you have to have a certain mindset. Um, you have to have that mindset of survival, amen, that will help you in the world. But now the kingdom of God is, is a different uh, uh, entity. The mindset that helps you in the world would not help you in the kingdom of God, but you see saints applying it. For example, in the world, um, you know, people always vie for positions. Uh, people want authority. People want to be in charge. People want to have a position. Uh, people want to make more money. But see, these things are not precepts in the kingdom of God. But however, we see these things happening in the kingdom of God. Uh, we see saints, jealousy, you know, uh, people trying to uh, get, take somebody's position, trying to uh, move people out of the way so that they can have that position. Uh, people using people because they're vulnerable. Amen. In the church. In the church. Amen. And so God is saying, look, he's saying, if you operate the way the world operates, you're going to receive of the punishment that the world receives. So he said, come out of this world, my people, uh, so that you won't be punished the way that she will be punished. And then in verse five, he says, her sins have reached heaven. Now that's going to take me back 
uh, to the book of Genesis. And when I talk about the Tower of Babel, which was constructed in the book of Genesis, uh, the Tower of Babel was Nimrod's first attempt to set up this one world government. And what Nimrod did, he, he built this tower. And I've heard it taught so many times in error that the reason he built the tower was he wanted to build the tower up to heaven. He, wanted, he was building it so high, he wanted to reach the throne of God. Okay, beloved, that's not true. Amen. Nimrod didn't have technology in those days. But Nimrod had enough common sense, just like you got common sense to know if you go outside and you look up at the heavens, you know good and darn well there is no way possible for you to build something so high that it reaches up to heaven. Nimrod's objective, when, when he said, I will reach heaven, Nimrod's objective was to go up on top of that tower. Amen, because they worship the sun god Osiris. Nimrod's objective was to go up on top of that tower. On top of the tower, because the, the Tower of Babel was what's known as a ziggurat. That was the name of it. And what happened is they went up on top of the ziggurats and they gave sacrifices to Satan. And so, uh, so by the top of the tower reaching heaven, uh, their intention was to go on top of the tower, amen, give sacrifices to Satan and have Satan himself manifest with them uh, there on the tower. And that's what they meant by reaching heaven. But now in verse five, he says what? Her sins have reached heaven, which is the sin Nimrod wanted his sin to reach heaven. And so now in the book of Revelation, uh, it actually happens. God did not allow it uh, when Nimrod built the Tower of Babel because it just was not time. Amen. God knew he would allow it to happen eventually, but he also knew that there were a certain number of spirits uh, who had not been birthed into this world who were children of light. And those children of light had to be given an opportunity to be born and to choose to serve God along with those children of darkness, those those. Uh, uh, children of darkness, those spirits of darkness, which had not been birthed into this earth, but which would come into this earth and choose to serve Satan. So at that particular time, it was not time yet. And so God did not allow this to come into fruition. But here in the book of Revelation, he finally allows it to happen so that it can finally be judged. Amen. Okay. Verse six says, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works. Now, uh, we were talking earlier about how sin never disappears. Amen. But sin uh, um, um, is taken and, and, and is collected and then is poured out in the wrath of God. So God's saying he's going to reward Babylon just the way that Babylon rewarded his saints. So those things which were done against his people, amen, God will repay. And uh, uh, those things that were done without mercy will have be judged, amen, without mercy. The people who did not show mercy to God's people will not be shown mercy when his judgment falls on them. So they'll be rewarded as they have done to the saints. And then he says, and give unto her double, what? According to her works. Remember, this is a two-part system. This is a political system. And this is a religious system. So each part of that system will be judged. And so that's when he says, give unto her double according to her works. Remember when the, when, the, when the angel in verse one, I said, the angel said, mystery Babylon is fallen, but he repeated it twice. He said, mystery Babylon is fallen, is fallen. One for the political system. The, the political system will be judged and taken out by God is fallen the second time uh, for the uh, religious system. The religious system will be taken out. So that's the double judgment uh, that it's talking about here in verse six. According to the work in the cup of which she had filled, filled to her double. The cup is the wrath of God. She's filled the wrath of God by uh, committing atrocities against God, by blaspheming God and committing atrocities 
against the people of God. Okay. How much she have glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord that judges her. You know, looking at this crisis that we have right now uh, with the coronavirus, it's amazing that a virus so tiny, so tiny that it takes a very special microscope uh, to even be able to see it. If you want to see it under a microscope, you have to have a very special microscope. It's amazing to me that a virus so tiny can cause so much havoc in the world. Amen. This little tiny virus is, is causing death. It's causing sickness. Uh, it, it's crumbling the world's economy. It's tearing down the world's economy. It's overloading the world's system of commerce and supply. Amen. Um, it's causing confusion. It's, it's causing uh, um, among religious among uh, religious leaders. Uh, it's causing confusion among political leaders. Uh, they're passing laws which violate the very uh, First Amendment of the Constitution. But nevertheless, and all of this is being done by a virus so tiny. And so what I'm saying all this to say that we should never, ever lose faith in what God can do. And, you know, God will always surprise us uh, when he moves. It's always in a way that's just unexpected. Amen. At least, I mean, in my life, he's always seemed like he's moved in, in some kind of surprise, unexpected fashion. And so it's just amazing what God can do. Amen. So, you know, we should never take God for granted. Um, one thing we've got happening is we've got, um, uh, um, you know, the world is under quarantine. And uh, we've got a lot of people arguing because a lot of governments are saying, well, you can't have church services. Well... First of all, you know, man is not greater than God. Uh, you can't, it's, it's against our constitution to tell people they can't have church service. And people are saying, well, obey the law of the land. Well, uh, you know, God's law is a higher law. Now, I'm not saying that the guidelines are not for social distancing are not right. They are right. Personally, I'm obeying those guidelines. Amen. Personally, you know, I'm not um, actively going into a crowd, a crowded church on Sunday like I normally do. Uh, so personally, I'm, I'm because I mean, amen, common sense. But now if a man or woman of God is having church services, who am I to say that they're not doing what God wants them to do? So the law of the land cannot supersede the law of God. Amen. God is in control. How can the creature pass a law which supersedes the, the, the law of the creator? How can the creature be bigger than the creator? In the Bible, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So how can man come back and say, well, don't have church? Now, I'm, you know, I'm not condoning one way or the other. But what I'm saying is that common sense will tell you, you know, do what's right, do what's prudent. But also, uh, you can't tell people they can't have church. That's, that's violating God's law. Amen. Nevertheless, if you go, fine. I'm not mad at you because I don't know what God told you to do. I don't know how he moves you. Amen. If he tells me to go, I'm going. But now, in during this uh, pandemic, I'm, you know, let's use common sense. I'm, I'm using common sense. You know, if I don't go and run around the church, it doesn't mean I'm not saved. Amen. And, and, and a lot of times, see, this is what we think salvation is. Salvation is more uh, than going to church on Sunday, amen, and listening to a word and then getting up and leaving. That's more. That's just a little part of salvation. So if, if, if that defines my salvation, and if other than that, you know, I got to, I, I can't focus. I can't think, you know, because, oh, oh, I can't go and sit in a church. Then something wrong with me, baby, because my relationship with God is much deeper. Amen. Than going sitting in a building. 
But nevertheless, let me get back. Okay, I just had to put that out. Okay. Um, verse 8 says, Therefore, so because she has said she's a queen and no widow, and she's, she, this system uh, has gotten to the point where they feel like, you know, they rule and nothing can happen to bring them down. God says, for this reason, shall her plagues, in verse 8, come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth us, who judgeth her. Verse 9, and the kings of the earth, and who? The kings of the earth. The kings of the earth, the presidents, the rulers, the prime ministers, the dictators, the people that run the countries of the earth, the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and have de lived deliciously with her because Satan has rewarded them in this life for serving him. They shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. In other words, they're going to be astonished. And they are going to uh, hate, you know, because it causes them to lose out on the advantages and the things that they gain and the things that they had uh, by being a part of this system. But in verse 10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment. So they're going to see this system come crashing down and they're going to stand far off and, and well because why? They don't want it to happen to them. Amen. It's going to be so uh, uh, um, devastating. It's going to be so awesome. Uh, that they're going to stand afar off and, and they're going to wail for her torment. Um, amen. Same. Okay, where am I? Come on now. Okay, my technology. Me and my technology ain't working together like we should. Amen. We're not being on one accord. Okay. And uh, so these kings, they're going to stand off. Uh, for in that one hour, the judgment is going to come. Uh, let's go down to verse 11. Verse 11 says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Who are the merchants of the earth? They are the rich people, the people who benefit uh, from the calamities that they cause in the earth. Amen. Um, the arms dealers, the pharmacy companies, you know, they call, they say they've got a, a drug for coronavirus. Well, they may have had the drug all along. They may have started the virus. Amen. But now they got a drug and I know it's not going to be free. So the merchants of the earth, um, they're going to mourn because why? No man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Why? Because uh, sickness is only a product of sin and death. Amen. There's no sickness in God's kingdom. So in God's kingdom, when God's kingdom come, comes, they're not going to be able uh, to make drugs and jack the prices up. I was looking at, at some of the prices on, on one of the medications that I have to have. And uh, um, I mean, it, it says it costs like hundreds of dollars for a little small pill. Amen. Hundreds of dollars just for one pill that it probably takes them maybe two or three pennies to produce. Hey, hey man, come on now. That's not, God never intended for men to do this to other men. Amen. And so he's going to bring that down. Okay, now I'm going to read verse 12 and 13. Okay. The merchandise, this is tells what they're getting of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thinine wood and all manners of ivory and all manner of vessels of the most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. The last two items, the political system makes men to be slaves because they are enslaved to that system. Amen. Uh, uh, it's disguised, but basically if you work a day, if you work all week and the only money that you make in that week is only enough money to carry you through that week. If you have to live from paycheck to paycheck, beloved, you are a slave, a slave to the system. That's the way the system is designed. Amen. Uh, for those people, you know, if you're living on paycheck to paycheck, and, and even more, I mean, even if you got a little bit of money left over, 
you know, at the end of the pay period, you know, a little bit, you know, you still, hey man, it's still a system of slavery because you're spending all your time to get just enough money to live. That's no different. The slave did the same thing, but he didn't get money. But, hey amen, they did feed the slave and, and, and keep him healthy enough to continue to work. They did feed him enough so that he could continue to work. And, you know, when he was sick, they did things to get him healthy so that he could go back to work. Well, beloved, this system is no different. And then it says, and souls of men. That's the religious part of the system. Amen. Uh, the religious part is the enemy. Uh, he has people worshiping him. Uh, Satan has people and even people in the church, you know, have been deceived. People in churches are deceived. And in many instances, we worship him. A lot of the rituals and traditions that we have in the church are not of God. Uh, these are things that Satan has instituted through men. And, you know, sometimes you might do something in the church. And, amen, it's not the word of God, but it's a good idea. You know, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's a good way to do business. It's not necessarily biblical, but it's a good way to do business. Well, that's fine. But what happens is when that way of doing business becomes, uh, uh, takes precedence over the people who serve in the church, what happens is that rather than the church ministering to the people and serving the people, those things turn the tables to where the people are now serving the church. And that's not the way God intended. Amen. God did not intend for us to serve the church. He intended for the church to serve the people. Amen. And for all to serve him. So now if your church organization is bigger in your mind than God, and to a lot of people it is, amen, then you know, you're know you serving, you're not serving God, but you're serving that organization. Uh, and this is the whole basis. I'm saying all it is to say that this is the basis of the false religion. I'm not saying it to put down churches, but I'm saying that this is the basis of that false religion. Amen. This is not the true church. This is the false church. The false church has got to look like the truth. Satan has got to make it look real. Amen. But it's not real. But it's got to look real. Why? Because he's a liar and a deceiver and deception is his weapon. Okay. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after, verse 14, are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein was made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour... She is made desolate. Now, okay, what's happening here is that city, uh, of course, we're talking about that system. Uh, we're talking about how that system is destroyed. And so that the people who benefited from that system, who served Satan and benefited from that system, uh, they basically, they lose everything that they have. And so now, um, you know, they hate it. And, and they're willing about it, but they're standing afar off because uh, they see how, how devastating this judgment is and they don't want to be a part of it. Amen. Um, when he talks about the, the sailors on the sea or the people on the sea, uh, what he's talking about is commerce because merchandise is transported between continents on the oceans. You know, trucking and, 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 and airplanes, you know, they, they transport mainly merchandise within countries, mainly by trucking. But between continents, uh, merchandise, the sea has to be used as a means of uh, commercial benefit. And so when this system is brought down, those people who gain their money, amen, uh, through this part of the system, 
uh, they will also see that that system has been uh, shut down and that they have no more means of gaining money. Okay, uh, verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets of God, for God hath avenged you on her. So all the dirt she did is coming back, and God is telling his people. He's saying rejoice. People, a lot of times I heard people say, well, you don't rejoice when, when evil, something bad happens. But right here, God is saying rejoice. Why? Because this city is against him. This is anti-God. Amen. Uh, so anything, uh, uh, anytime God punishes our enemy, uh, Satan, anytime he brings us the works of the devil to nothing, we have a right to rejoice. Amen. God tells us in his word to rejoice. Verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voices of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. So the utter desolation of this system. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. So this system is totally destroyed. So when God judges, amen, it's a total and complete judgment. Uh, you know, judgment comes slow, but when it comes, it's thorough. It's very thorough. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times we, because judgment takes so long, because it takes so long for God to judge, uh, people get comfortable in their sin. Amen. But when judgment does come, it's final is complete and is total. Okay. Uh, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. And by thy sorcery, were nations deceived by thy deception, sorcery, uh, uh, witchcraft is, is deception. So by that deception, by their deception, by the lust of the flesh, witchcraft is the, the lust of the flesh also when the flesh fights against the things of God. And because of this, because they rebelled against God, amen, they deceived all the nations to do so. Verse 24, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all them that were slain upon the earth. Now, let me tell you, this blood, amen, that was found in her has been in her crying out for judgment. Uh, remember when uh, Abel, Cain shed Abel's blood, Abel's blood cried out for judgment. Jesus' innocent blood has been crying out for judgment. The blood of every innocent person who has been killed uh, for the sake of the gospel has been crying out for judgment. Every wrong deed that has been done to the people of God, that wrong deed has been crying out for judgment. Amen. Every time, whether a judgment actually came on the earth like it was supposed to, uh, amen. If it was done on the earth, see, that's, that's a good thing because it's done. Amen. But those who have been wronged throughout history, uh, that blood uh, or, or that judgment is crying out for vengeance from God. Amen. And God will repay. Okay. He's a fair God. Amen. Because he is a just God, because he is a fair God, he will repay. It will not go unpaid. So uh, uh, be encouraged, saints of God. Those of you have been persecuted for the sake of God. Amen. You've been persecuted because you are a child of God. I want you to know today that God will repay. Okay. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all that was slain upon the earth. All right. Amen. Um, that concludes what I have for you today. Um, it was a little bit longer, amen, but, you know, I had a lot to cover this time, and being that I hadn't talked to you in a while, um, I had to add some extra things in, but I hope and pray that it was a blessing to you, amen, because it was a blessing to me. Uh, this is the same message that I delivered on the radio a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, it's different today than, than when it was when I delivered it a couple of weeks ago.
Amen. Let me get out of here. Amen. I'm, I, I kept you long enough. This is Elder Cedric Rice, New Horizons in the Word of God. God bless you men and women of God. And from this time until the next time that I talk to you, or if the Lord come, I pray that those days be the best days of your life.